like I, I shit you guys not like I'm, I'm really not trying to toot my own horn, but there are people that are in my practice that have been on treatment for like have been in therapy and medication for anxiety for like 15 years. And within six months, we're taping them off of medication. And they feel fantastic. Why? Is it because I'm a brilliant clinician? No, this is what I'm saying. I'm not actually any better. It's just I use tools that none of my colleagues use. I use Ayurveda. So Ayurveda. So Ayurveda is traditional Indian medicine and differs from Western medicine in a couple of very important ways. The first thing to understand about Western medicine is that it's about dividing and zooming in. So Western medicine is about classification, zooming in, subclassification, further classification. So for example, we have different kinds of doctors, right? I'm a psychiatrist, which means in the grand field of medicine, I've zoomed in on the mind and I've specialized in that. And then even further, I'm an addiction psychiatrist. So I zoom in on addictions and I specialize in that. And even more than that, I'm sort of like now becoming more and more of a technology addiction psychiatrist. So I'm like zooming in further and like learning more about technology addiction. So that's how Western medicine works. We sort of divide things into groups like cardiology, nephrology, hepatology, infectious disease, psychiatry, endocrinology, pediatrics, OB, ob gyn right? So we divide things into lots and lots of categories, and then we become super specialized in one category. Ayurveda is completely different. Ayurveda is not about zooming in. It's about generating patterns from multiple data points. So it's kind of looking at different dimensions of a person and trying to figure out how can we make correlations based on their physical body about what's going on in their mind? Is there some way that we can understand someone's bowel movements and how that will affect their mind? Is there a relationship between how prominent the veins on the back of their hand are? Like, I don't know if you guys can see this, but like my veins are kind of visible. And what that says about their mind. Is there a correlation between how cold their hands and fingers and feet get and their bowel movements? Is there a correlation between their mind and their skin? So Ayurveda looks at like lots of different dimensions of a person and tries to develop an overarching pattern that describes that individual. So that's like fundamentally different from Western medicine because what we do in Western medicine is we try to break patterns apart and zoom in and understand individual elements. It's like, how does the heart work in this person? What are the principles of the heart? Um, you know, so it's just, it's like the exact opposite. One is zooming in and one is building up. The other big difference between uh, Ayurveda and, and Western medicine is like, if we think about the gold standard of knowledge in each system of medicine. So in, um, in Western medicine or allopathic medicine, the, the standard that we use, the gold standard of our medicine is something called a randomized controlled trial. This is abbreviated as an RCT. So an example of a randomized controlled trial is I take 10,000 people and let's say I'm trying to figure out depression. Then what I do is I split them into two groups, a control group and an intervention group. And I give 5,000 people an antidepressant and I give 5,000 people a sugar pill. Then what I do, the reason we called it controlled is because we try to make the two groups the same. We try to have them have the same socioeconomic status, the same average age, the same gender breakdown. So we try to remove a lot of the individuality so we can isolate the effect of the disease and the treatment. So we're trying to get dep treat depression, not individuals, and we're trying to use randomization and controlling for variables to remove any individuality from the equation. So I'm trying to just look at a disease in isolation and a treatment in isolation and see what the impact of the, the treatment is on the disease. So what this means practically is that Western medicine is not about treating people, it's about treating diseases. Um, and so that sort of like, in a, if you've sort of trained in Western medicine, you may think that that's the best way. But as you learn clinical medicine, you begin to realize that like people are fundamentally different, right? Like, even if I prescribe, I'm a psychiatrist, I prescribe antidepressants from time to time. Try to avoid it whenever possible. Um, but one of the things you quickly learn if you prescribe medication is that medication, even though like antidepressants will have a moderate improvement in clinical trials for people, an individual may get better or may not get better at all if you give them an antidepressant. There's a lot of like individuality that enters medicine. The funny thing is that our system of medicine doesn't sort of factor that in. 
we don't really factor in individuality in terms of our, our clinical trials and the gold standard of our information. So Ayurveda is fundamentally different because Ayurveda like treats a person. It presumes that all human beings are different and that in order to like help someone, you have to understand like individually how they function. So I'll give you guys kind of an example. So Ayurveda divides all people into like these three, you have this thing called a doshic balance. And doshas are sort of the three, three major patterns that kind of govern what people are like. So Ayurveda says, unlike Western, so Ayurveda says that individuals have like a cognitive fingerprint that is like different and that different peoples have different, different people have different kinds of cognitive fingerprints. What do I mean by a cognitive fingerprint? When we think about Western psychology, we tend to think that all human beings sort of have like the same psychology, right? If you study psychology, you don't study like an individual, you study like the different like patterns of psychology. So you study like motivation, you study things like habit, you study things like, um, you know, uh, let's say like hedonics, you study like cognitive behavioral therapy, you study like these general principles about the mind and like cognitive behavioral therapy applies to like everyone, right? You study kind of like one thing and it sort of assumes that it works for everyone because everyone's mind has cognitions, has emotions, and has behaviors and that those three things are related. Ayurveda starts by saying that everyone's mind is unique and that in order to help people, we have to understand what kind of mind they have because the kind of treatment or intervention that we want to use depends on the kind of mind that they have. So I started using this phrase cognitive fingerprint and I used this idea of cognitive fingerprint, which is like your unique cognitive makeup. And once we understand your unique cognitive fingerprint, we can structure your life or your diet or your environment to fit with your cognitive fingerprint. And one of the biggest problems that I think a lot of gamers run into is that they assume that they're lazy or they're not functional or they do a bad job because they're using sort of a, a standard gold standard. They're using a gold standard of what it means to be successful, like a standard cognitive fingerprint. So I'll give you an example. Like they think that you should be disciplined. They think that you should be focused. They think that you should wake up at the same time every day. They think that, you know, these are the things that lead to success. Whereas Ayurveda says, actually, that's not, that's just one route to success. And if your cognitive fingerprint is different, that the way that you can like be, be successful is to kind of play to your strengths. So I think this is going to be way easier to understand once I actually explain, start explaining specifics. So the first thing is that there are three doshas, vata, pitta, and kapha. So vata is kind of like the wind, pitta is kind of like fire, and kapha is kind of like earth. Okay, so this should work great for gamers because these are like the elements of your Pokemon, right? So like if you have a Vata mind, you're like an air Pokemon. If there's an air po Pokemon or like grass or some shit, right? If you're a Pitta Pokemon, you're like a fire Pokemon. If you're a Guffa Pokemon, you're like an earth or water Pokemon. So I'll give you guys an example. So Vatas are like the wind. So I'm super Vata. So Vatas have memories and mindsets that are like the wind. So I get really, really passionate very easily. Like I blow, I'm like a gust of wind. So I get super excited and I say that I'm going to teach about Ayurveda today. And I get super hyped up about it and I blow really hard about Ayurveda. And then like a week later, I, just like the wind, I just randomly die down. So my mind gets super excited about stuff and then like randomly dies down. So I get really, I get excited about stuff, but follow through is very difficult for my mind. Other examples of, of vatas include like interests that change very quickly. So, you know, um, like a month ago, I was reading a bunch about Carl Jung and now I'm like, okay, I'm done with Jung. I'm ready to move on to something else. Um, and so that's a, a, another example. So interests like the wind. The other thing about vatas is that their, their mind learns very quickly. So vatas, much like the wind, can blow really hard in one direction. So if you drop me in a random like job within two or three days, I'll be really good at it. So when I was like in medical school, I did a really great job because like it, I learned super fast. The downside to Vata is that you forget super fast too. So Vata memory kind of like is, is easy to learn and easy to forget. So when I meet people, people think I'm super smart. Like you guys think I'm super smart. 
And then, like, the problem is that, like, if you know me for a while, I'm not going to seem nearly as smart as I come across, like, at the very beginning, because Vatas are super dynamic, and their memory, like, we just learn things very quickly, but we forget things very quickly. Other examples of Vata, uh, so remember that Ayurveda says that, like, your mind has correlations with your, your body. So Vatas are also what we call people with fast metabolisms. So if we look at, if we look at, like, people's physical bodies, we know that there are three groups of people. Like, you can sort of just look at people, and everyone knows this. The first is that there are people with fast metabolisms. So I can basically eat whatever I want to, and I'm not going to gain a whole lot of weight. Then there are people who have medium builds, and then there are people who are what we call big-boned. So medium builds are pittas, and big-boned people are kaffas. And so kaffa people who are like big-boned, they can eat salads every day, and they're still going to be chunky. That's just their, uh, that's what their Ayurvedic dosha sort of dictates. And vata people are going to always kind of be thin. The other thing about vata body types is that like they have angular features. So if you look at my face, like my nose is like very like angular, right? It's like sharp. The features of my, um, like my, my face is sort of angular. And if you, if you guys saw like, for example, on, on the last stream, we had uh, Joro, which by the way, Joro did do his stuff, which we'll talk about in a minute, but um, we had someone named Joro, and Joro's a classic guffa. Like, he has a very round face. Like, I can't even, like, grow a full beard. So vatas have very, like, scant facial hair, whereas guffas have, like, full facial hair. Um, and vatas also use their hands a lot. So, like, I use my hands a lot when I'm talking. My mind also jumps around a lot. Like, for example, just now I just commented about Joro, and I was like, oh, yeah, like, I want to say something about Joro, and then I'm kind of coming back. So vatas are sort of like, they have a mind that's like ADHD. So compare that to pittas, um, who uh, have a memory that's sort of like sharp and clear. Pittas' personalities, unlike being, they're not, they're not as dynamic as vatas, but they're very driven, they're very focused. Pitta, uh, pitta mindset is a very argumentative. So if you guys have seen Tom on stream, like he's a good example of a pitta. He's kind of like medium build, not very skinny, not very fat. Um, he also like, believes that like once he understands something that's the way it is so like bittas have a difficulty between understanding like opinion and fact like if they if they have logically concluded something they think that that is objectively correct um so that's like a pitta whereas vatas can see like all the different angles around a situation because their mind is kind of like the wind blows this way okay i feel this way one day i feel this way one day i see this person's uh opinion i see this person's angle i can understand this i can understand that whereas pittas are like they're very driven and focused so a lot of what we think leads to success in life is a pitta mind driven focused ambitious follow through uh, they also tend to have medium features, not particularly anger, uh, uh, angular, not particularly round. Um, and when it comes to goals, they can be a little bit like pit bulls. Like once they grab onto something, it's really hard for them to let go. The third uh, dosha is, is something called kapha. So kapha is like earth and water. So kapha uh, a lot of people that I know, um, you know, think that they're not smart when actually they're just kaphas. So one of the things to remember about kapha is that they learn slowly, but they also forget slowly. So kaphas take time to like get up to their, they, they have like slow acceleration, but they can hit very high velocities. Whereas vatas have very high acceleration and then like very like high negative acceleration and like low velocity at the end of it. So they take their time, kaphas take their time to get um, started. Guffas are also what we call big bones, so they tend to be heavy set. It's easy for them to gain weight. They have very round features, and guffas tend to be very, very resilient. Uh, so they can withstand large amounts of like negative situations and sort of handle that pretty well because they they kind of have like high constitutions or high endurance. Whereas like vatas, you can think of as like people that are like low HP pools and low endurance. So like guffas are tanks. Vatas are, I guess, like mages, and like pittas are like DPS dealers. So if you think about like, you know, like like melee DPS, like that's a pitta. A tank is a guffa, and a vata is like a, a mage or like a very like dynamic rogue or something like that. Um, and we're talking about Ayurveda, by the way. So I'll just give you guys, so that's kind of like a brief overview of the three prakrutis, and we'll kind of dive into this a little bit more. So people who are vata um, tend to get like bored of situations very easily. They have difficulty with follow through. 
So one of the most Im- important lessons I learned is one of my teachers once told me that what I should do is like as many things as I can. So they were kind of telling me that I should juggle as many balls as I can at the same time without dropping a single one. And when I was in college, like I started out doing a bunch of stuff my freshman year, like I ran for student government, joined a bunch of clubs, joined a fraternity, took a bunch of like random classes, like I took Japanese and Spanish and like chemistry and like all kinds of random stuff, philosophy. And that's like a super vata way to approach life. You're kind of doing a bunch of stuff. And then over time, like I did bad at all of it because I was just playing too many video games. And like I found that the more I kind of scaled back, uh, the fewer things I did, the more bored I became. And the more bored I became, the less I felt like doing anything. And so what one person told me is that as a vata, you need to do a couple of different things because your mind is going to be... Um, your mind is going to be super dynamic. So just understand that you're going to get bored. So now what I do as a psychiatrist, like once I understood that principle, I realized like I'm never going to have a nine to five job. I'm just never going to like, if I just have a nine to five job and I do the same thing every day, I'm going to be like bored as fuck and I'm going to do a bad job at it. So I realized that I need to structure a dynamic life. And I think a lot of gamers are very vata. So I'll give you guys an example of like what my day job is like. So I see patients, I'm a psychiatrist, so I see patients for somewhere between like two and 10 hours a day. I teach, I do consulting, so I'll go to like an actual investment bank and I'll teach a group of bankers how to meditate. I stream, um, and yeah, so like, and then I also write. So like I try to do four or five different things every week, and I find that the more diverse my skill set is, like the more I'm doing different kinds of things, the more I enjoy it. Because my problem is not like I never run out of energy. I get bored. So if things are interesting to me, then I actually have a very, very high amount of energy and I can work like 80 hours a week as long as I'm doing stuff that's engaging. So in order to sort of build a life that's structured around my cognitive fingerprint, if I'm doing one job for 80 hours a week, I'm going to do a terrible job. I'm going to just suck at it. Like week after week after week after week after week after week after week, I'm just going to get bored. Like I'm already, I've been streaming for about two months and I'm already like getting a little bit bored with streaming because that's what happens. Like I do something super gung-ho for like a month and then I sort of don't feel like doing it. And so in order for me to be successful, what I need to do is like build a life that, that corresponds with my Vata mind. So I need to be able to do as many different things as I can and still do them successfully. So that's why I became a psychiatrist. Like if I was a surgeon, like it's really hard to write books, teach, and stream if you're doing surgery. It's way easier if you're doing psychiatry because I have a flexible schedule. And so I think if you're a vata, what you need to understand is like you're going to get bored easily. So rather than just doing one thing, you actually need to be doing as many different things as you can successfully. So one of the biggest problems that I see with gamers is that they think like, okay, if you're stuck in life and you're like, unemployed, you're not in school, you're living with your parents, you kind of think that I just need to do one thing well, right? Like, I just need to, like, get my degree, or I just need to find a job, or I just need to move out of your my house. And I shouldn't write a sci-fi TV show, I shouldn't start a business, I should just do my school. And everyone that you talk to says that if you're going nowhere in life, just, like, start with one thing and do that one thing well. Where I say, fuck that. If you're a vata, don't just do one thing. That's the reason why you're stuck is because your whole life you're listening to this advice that is for a cognitive fingerprint that is like not your brain. Like your brain is not wired like that. Your brain is kind of ADHD. So if your brain is kind of ADHD, you need to build a life that's kind of ADHD. And so actually what you need to do is I'd say, start your business, enroll in classes, find a job, And start writing your sci-fi TV show. Do all four of them. Just dive right in and do as many different things as you can. And over time, you'll actually find that, you know, you have to find the right sort of balance so that that takes practice. So you have to figure out, okay, like if I'm going to take, you know, half a class load, can I have like half a class load and a part-time job? And then also like write on the side or like develop like a Google Analytics certification on the side. So my advice for gamers who are super vata is actually try to do more than one thing. Because the reason that you guys go back to video games is because you get bored of that one thing. 
But if you have something else that is interesting and exciting that you can turn to instead of a video game, you're going to do way better. The problem is that if you just enroll in classes, like you get bored of classes by the end of month one, and then you start playing a video game, and then the video game has its particularly addictive properties, and it kind of sucks you in. And by the way, video games are very satisfying to Vatas, especially if you play like a lot of different video games. But if you think about like an MMO, like what, how does an MMO like keep you engaged? It's because an MMO isn't just one thing, right? You like go and you like harvest flowers and then you spend some time on the auction house and then you spend some time doing like your 25 man raids and then you spend some time doing your five man raids. You do some PP PVP. Like think about that for a second. If you're addicted to an MMO, if you just did PVP all the time, like you're not Vata. The reason that a lot of people fall into uh, MMOs is because MMOs offer a really wide skill set, uh, like kinds of activities that engage your mind in different ways. And so what I want you to think about is think about your life like an MMO. And the more that you structure your life like an MMO, actually, the better you're going to do if you have a lot of Vata. So what you've got to do is think about, okay, like, what is my equivalent of PvP? What is my equivalent of PvE? What is my equivalent of Auction House? Okay, I'm going to find a job where I do this. I'm going to do this side hustle, which is like selling domain names. I'm going to do like a Google Analytics certification, and I'm going to enroll in classes. Like, that's how you should structure your life. Do more, not less. And then understand that as you start to do something, like prepare yourself for when you get bored. And as you get bored, that's completely fine. Just move to the next thing that's like productive on your list. Be like, okay, I'm tired of studying. Let me like log in and, and do a few hours of my Google Analytics certification. And structure your life to have variety. And if you structure a life that has a lot of variety, then your Vata mind is going to be satisfied from it. And then it won't need to turn to the MMO for variety. Does that make sense? So I'm going to take a, a quick pause um, and just look at questions on Discord. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, are Vata immature? No. So this is a classic example. So someone is asking me if Vatas are immature. No. So this is because our society has a standard of maturity. We say that if you are not this way, you are immature. Vatas come across as immature. But what I would say is like, it's like, imagine that you have stats like for a mage and then like you try to do like melee DPS. Like you're going to suck at that. And, and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to label yourself with being like bad, like immature. Do you guys get that? Immaturity is like a label of just badness. It just means that you're doing a shitty job at life. Whereas what you need to recognize is that your mind has certain strengths and certain weaknesses. And the more that you structure your life to be in line with your mind, you're not going to come across as immature. So I'm going to tell you guys this very simply. I'm fucking lazy. I'm not disciplined. I'm fucking lazy. I, I still love to play video games. I procrastinate. I don't like to do work. I play video games instead of doing work. I'm actually no different from you. I don't think my stats are different from like pretty much anyone on stream. I think the biggest difference is that I understand I'm Vata. I get it. And I recognize that this is the way that I am. And then I structure my life to suit who I am in my mind. Like, stru like structure it to suit my cognitive fingerprint. And if you start structuring your life to be like designed for your cognitive fingerprint, we'll get to the other doshas in a second. Then you're going to start to do a lot better. So the reason that I'm successful is because I actually do a bunch of different shit. And there are colleagues of mine that are like, I don't understand. So for example, I, you know, some of my friends from residency, they're hardcore researchers. So they're like experts in their one field. Like I have a, a friend of mine who's just an expert in schizophrenia and she's like a neuroscience researcher does clinical work with people who have schizophrenia, does like research on people who do schizophrenia, on, like does brain scans of people who do schizophrenia. And she has no idea like how I can manage. She's like, if I was doing all the random crap you're doing, I would suck at it. And I come back at her with the same thing. If I was just doing schizophrenia day in and day out, day in and day out, day in and day out, I would suck at it. The problem is that our society labels her as disciplined and mature and labels me as a fuck up, which is sort of true, 
But the difference is like at the end of the day, like we both ended up training at Harvard Medical School and we're both faculty at Harvard Medical School. And so how is it that both of us wind up at the same degree of like professional success? It's because I understand that I'm a Vata and I created a Vata life and that she's a Kapha and she created a Kapha life. And so you have to figure out what's your dosha and how can you develop a life that is structured to be easy for you, right? If you're, if you've got like mage stats, like you want to be casting spells, you don't want to be like melee DPSing someone with a dagger. But the problem is that our society says that like melee DPS is the way to go. And then you also have your tanks who are like, we suck at melee DPS. And so then they look at themselves and they say like, I suck at life because I suck at melee DPS. What I'm trying to tell you guys is like, well, you're a fucking tank. So you're supposed to be doing a different thing. You have a different job. And what I like about Ayurveda is that Western medicine says that melee DPS is the only way to go. This is success. Society says that this is the only way to go. This is how Western society works, right? We think in terms of polarities. We think in terms of like good or bad. We don't really think in terms of shade or shades of gray. We think like Republican or Democrat. We think like conservative or liberal. We think about like everything is like a, pol like a polarity. And, but that's just not how we are. There's like, like human beings are a spectrum. And the more that you understand where you lie on the spectrum, the more you can understand how to like structure your life in the right way. Um, yeah, so then people are, are talking about mage tanks, right? Yeah, so you could be a battle mage, right? You can be like, like you can wear heavy armor, you can cast some spells, and then you can also like wield a fucking two-handed sword. You can do that. So some people are bi doshik or tri doshik. And the thing to remember about people that are bi doshik or tri doshik is that they're no like better or worse than other people. It's just like, if you're a battle mage, you're not going to be as good of just a straight up spellcaster as a straight mage. You're also going to be like not have, you're not going to have the same weaknesses. So my weaknesses and my strengths are very, very polarized. I'm not like a middle of the road kind of person. I'm super vata. And so if you're a battle mage, you're like, you're like a kapha pitta vata, right? So you do some spell casting, you do some melee DPS, and you're kind of tanky. You're not going to be as extreme as any people who are vata pitta or kapha, but you're going to be like kind of like well-rounded. So some, some people are doshik like that. So if you're not vata, let's go through the other ones, right? So if you're pitta, you're driven, you're focused, you're argumentative. I want you guys to imagine like a dog that like latches onto something and doesn't let go. So upsides of pitta are that they are like we think about when we think about pittas, like that's what we think about as mature and successful. We think about people who devote themselves to one career, right? They're like, I'm going to be an attorney. And they like work really hard and they go to school, they go to a good law school and they're like super argumentative. Fantastic. That's pitta. Downsides of pitta, they're obsessional, right? So if you guys have seen like Tom's stream and stuff like that, Tom has an obsessional mind. He gets like super caught up with stuff. He can't let things go. So it's not like pittas are better than vatas. We just have to understand the, the strengths and weaknesses of each one. So pittas tend to be driven and argumentative, but also have like a lot of problems with like anger and irritability. So like pittas get bent out of shape. They create a lot of like interpersonal conflict. They rub shoulders with people the wrong way. They're going to kind of like, you know, when it comes to um, like advancement, you know, they're hyper competitive, which can kind of screw them over or allow them to be successful. Right. So that's a pitta. So that has certain strengths and certain weaknesses. Um, and then kapha is like your tank. So kaphas are stable. They're resilient, which means they can withstand a lot of punishment. So Vata would have quit two weeks in. A pitta is going to stick around for some time and then like move on to the next thing. A kapha will like stay true to whatever they're doing, sometimes to the point of excess. So the best friend that you can have is a kapha. And I want you guys to think about the people that you know in your life. You know that person who you met who was like intensely friendly with, to you and they were like, man, you are the most awesome person in the, in the world. We are best friends forever. You had this like really, really intense friendship with them. You guys did everything. And then they fucking fell off the face of the earth. They just like one day they disappeared and then you just never saw them again. And that's your Vata friend, right? Your Pitta friend is the person who's like, 
pretty reliable. You can count on them, but like, it's just fucking annoying to argue with them. Like you, they get into arguments with you about stupid shit and you just can't, like, you're never going to win an argument with them because they're just going to never like listen to your point of view. And that's a bit that your kaffa is the friend that you've been with for 10 years. They're the person who's always been there for you. They reach out to you from time to time. You guys stay in touch. Or if you're that kind of person, that's a kaffa friend. So it's not like one is better than the other. These are just different dimensions. And so kaffas are resilient. They're stable. Like, so you should understand that you're able to withstand punishment that a lot of other people, you have staying power. You have endurance. You're going to outlast other people. And over time, Guffas, the, the problem that Guffas get into is that sometimes they can, they're so good at withstanding punishment that they don't make changes when they need to. Whereas Vatas make changes when they shouldn't. They're like, okay, I have a great job. I'm going to fucking quit because I'm bored. They should stick with it, but they don't. Guffas, on the other hand, find themselves in a bad situation or like a bad relationship and they like, they stick with it even though they should leave. So I'm going to address a couple of questions. Um, the first thing is, can people have like multiple uh, amounts? Absolutely. So some people can have like a vata memory and like a kapha, let's say like, mm, let me think about this. So like people can be like, have kapha friendships and a vata memory. Like generally speaking, they kind of lump together, but everyone is tri doshik. Everyone has some level of each. So I want you guys to imagine that you have like, Imagine these are like stats. So like instead of like strength, intelligence, and like constitution, imagine that you have a Vata score, a Pitta score, and a Kapha score. And actually, there are... You can... Hold on. Um, I think I, I shared this with y'all, right? So here's an example. Okay. I don't know if this was posted in our Discord. So, so I want you guys to think about these as stats. Right? And everyone has like a certain number on each stat. The other thing is it's not like higher numbers mean better things. So disease or problems in Ayurveda arise when you're too when when your vata or when each of your dosha stats is too high or too low. So I have a dynamic mind. I learn things very quickly. And if my Vata stat like goes five points higher, like let's say my Vata is like a 75. If it goes like 10 points higher and I hit 85, then I have ADHD. At that point, my mind is so dynamic that it can't focus on one thing and it becomes like problematic for me. Whereas my Guffa stat is like super low. So like if, I, if, if my Guffa stat drops a little bit more, then I get like sick. So I physically like get ill very easily. Like I was a sick as a kid. Like it's like kind of like you have a low con stat, right? Like my poison resistance and my disease resistance and all that kind of shit is like really low. Anytime my kids get sick, I get sick. My wife is kapha. So she like everyone in the house can be sick and she's going to be fine. So like my immunity is weak. So I have like a low con stat, high int, right? So I want you guys to just... Imagine that e everyone has like different levels of these and you could be thry doshik. You can be like in the middle for each of these. And I hope if you guys take a look at the questionnaire, what you see is that there are different dimensions and that like, you know, you can have like vata and memory and like gaffa and friendships and like bitta and career. And that's just who the way that you are. And the way to become successful, in my opinion, is not to like, and this is, this is the problem, right? Is gamers think that there's one road to success. And you look at yourself and you say, if I was more disciplined, I would be successful. If I was more like that person, I would be more successful. If I was different, I would be more successful. And I say, fuck that. I say, look at who you are. Look at your strengths. Look at your weaknesses. And structure a life that is designed to befit you. Right? Like, if you're, if you're a caster, like, if you're playing Dark Souls and you have, like, mage stats, like, use spells. And the problem here is that, you know, you guys just aren't playing to your strengths. Okay, I'll stop using the word gamers. Um, so, so play to your strengths. Uh, yeah, so I just posted the questionnaire in chat, and then I'll post another one. 
Hold on. Um, so here's another example. So here's one that incorporates physical attributes as well. So what we're going to do, uh, you know, actually what I think I'll do is just, I'm going to switch streams for just a second. Okay, and what we're going to do, so let me just modify some of this stuff. Okay, we're going to go to this. Okay, weird. There we go. Okay. So here's an example of the the Prakriti questionnaire, okay? So this includes physical and mental stuff. So if, I don't know if you guys can read this, but this is weight. So vatas are usually thin, often difficult to put on weight, visible ribs. Medium build, good muscle tone is kaphas. I mean, is pittas. Kaphas are larger, difficult to lose weight, heavy bones. Vata skin is dry, cool, thin. Pitta skin is like oily, smooth, and warm with a lot of freckles or color in their face. So you guys should go look at Joro and look at the fucking color in his face. He's got a ton of color in his face. Gaffas have like thick skin, cool skin, oily. So hair tends to be like thin, kinky. Like, I don't know if you guys see this, but like my hair is like kinky as fuck. You guys see this? Like it, 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 it kinks. Like you see this action? Like it's not straight. Um, so, uh, pittas have like male pattern baldness oftentimes, um, and Gaffa's hair is like thick, wavy, oily, lustrous. So the other thing that's really interesting, I don't know if I'm going to see if I can, yeah, kinky hair, I know. So I want you guys to look at the top of my eyelid and see how it covers like the top of my iris. That's classically Vata. So there are even things like the more of your iris you can see, that's like pittas. You can see the entire iris of their eyes. And so there are all kinds of physical... Oh, this is great. <laughs> Appetite. There are all kinds of physical features. So my diagnostic question for vatas is, are your eyes larger than your stomach? And what I mean by that is that do, do you get intensely hungry and then get satisfied with a relatively small amount of food? Like you feel like you can eat like... a like, you know, 10 pounds of barbecue, but then you eat like half a plate and you're like, actually, I'm kind of full. So that's that's a classic vata appetite where your eyes are bigger than your stomach and you feel super, super hungry and you feel hungry erratically. Bithas have sort of an excessive appetite. Guffas have sort of a stable, regular appetite. Um, vatas tend to be prone to constipation. Uh, Bithas can have indigestion and can have like acid reflux and like stomach problems. Guffas can have like, um, you know, or kind of in the middle. Uh, yeah, so hey Gizmo. So, so now the question is, so people are talking, right? They're, they're like people in chat are commenting about various attributes of, of Vata, Pitta, and Guffa. And so now like what would be fascinating is... If you guys like go back and look at the comments that people are making and see if there's a consistency with Vata, right? So Gizmo has been saying that, that I think that they're pretty Vata. And so they're, they're talking about different attributes that are all Vata. So Vatas are reactive. Yes, they tend to be very reactive. Um, one other question that I want to get to is someone asked about Myers-Briggs. So I do believe that there's some correlation with Myers-Briggs. And the reason for that is very simple. For those of you guys who don't know, does anybody know what Myers-Briggs is based on? What's the foundation of Myers-Briggs? Anybody know? You can be a chubby vata. Nope, Myers-Briggs is not based on the big five. Yeah, so as Esther Q has it right. Based on Carl Jung. You know what? <laughs> this is fascinating. You know what Carl Jung's theories are based on? Did he come up with them himself? Nope, not Freud. Incorrect. Nope, not Nietzsche. Dank Moses has it correct. Carl Jung's theories are actually based on Ayurveda and Hindu philosophy. Right? 
So Carl Jung studies Ayurveda and then comes up with theories. And then Myers-Briggs studies Carl Jung and then comes up with Myers-Briggs. And so it correlates to Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. So just think about this for a second. Remember that Western psychology assumes that the mind is like uniform, right? The body is uniform. The heart functions a particular way. The mind functions a particular way. That's how it works. And then Myers-Briggs comes along and, and says people are fundamentally different, that not everyone is the same way, that there are introverts and extroverts, that there are people who judge and feel, right? Intuitive and perceptive, that fundamentally they're different kinds of human beings. Where do they get that idea? Why is it so contrary to the, the, the rest of Western psychology? Because it's based on Jung. Because Jung said people are fundamentally different. And then the question becomes, where did Jung learn it? He studied Ayurveda. So I'm going to show you guys interesting book. Okay. So. Here's an example. So like Jung studied a lot of Hindu psychology, philosophy, and medicine. He was actually like a, or Indian. Hindu, whatever. Um, so I think there are, there are correlations. So when I did some Myers-Briggs training and, and did some stuff myself, I was like, oh, this sounds a lot like Ayurveda. Yeah, so if you guys are mixtures of stuff, that's completely reasonable. Everyone is, is has all three elements, right? You've got all three stats. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to the next thing. So Stress Dessert asks the perfect question. Can you alternate between the doshas? Absolutely. So there's also... Uh, let me send you guys. You guys want to see science? Is ev anyone wondering whether... Any anyone wondering whether there's any science behind this stuff? Like, is this, is this like just... This is just theory, right? There's no like science behind it. This guy's like, he's one of these complementary and alternative like homeopath, Reiki people. It's not real. Come on. Can't be real. Right? There's no way. So, you guys want some science? There's the science. Okay? So I'll tell you what these two papers show. Yeah, it's some voodoo shit, right? The first is that what, what researchers in India did, there's, a, there's an emerging field called IU genomics. So what researchers did is they said, okay, they gave a bunch of people these questionnaires and they said like, okay, for all of the people who are Vata, let's check their genome. And for all the people who are Pitta, let's check their genome. And for all the people who are Kapha, let's check their genome. And are there statistically significant correlations between your genes and your dosha? And the answer is absolutely yes. That all Vatas, and just think about this for a second. People who are have fast metabolisms, they have to share certain traits. Our metabolism is common. People who are big boned have a metabolism that's fundamentally different from people who are, have fast metabolism. So that has to be our body types. Any person can look at the, down the street and you can say, oh, there's a thin person. There's a person who's big boned and there's a person who looks thin, but they clearly take care of themselves. Their thinness is not natural. It's due to effort. And you can just look at someone on the street and you can tell. There has to be a physiology behind this. And that's just how it works. So Ayurveda has been looking at this. And so, I mean, this second paper that I sent you guys is very interesting. It actually correlates Prakruti, which is Vata, Pitta, and Kapha, with different kinds of metabolism and diseases. What they did is they correlated Prakruti, like your Vata, Pitta, and Kapha, and how likely you are to have a particular kind of chronic disease. So Vatas are prone to autoimmunity. Autoimmune disease is a Vata disease. Pittas are prone to other kinds of diseases. Kaphas are prone to things like type 2 diabetes. Right? So there are correlations now. So now there's a, there's a huge area of research emerging in Ayurveda. And the more that we study it, the more that we scientifically analyze it, the more correct it turns out to be. Absolutely. So I want you guys to look back at like everything that Gizmo has said. 
Gizmo's textbook Vata. Has fucking lupus. Has ADHD mind. Is super Vata. Has eyes that are larger than their stomach. Right? Like, has an autoimmune disease. Like, I can't diagnose people over the internet, but, you know, we kind of diagnosed Gizmo over the internet. Like, I don't know anything about Gizmo, but I can predict that the likelihood that Gizmo has an autoimmune disease is greater than other people who are Pitta or Kapha. So that's what's awesome about Ayurveda. Like, you can make predictions about your life. And if you... Uh, if you sort of understand that, then that's, that's fantastic, because you can start to live accordingly. So the cool thing about Ayurveda is that if you do have an autoimmune disease, if you do vata-lowering treatments, your autoimmune disease should get better. Right? So, like, if you adjust your vata, now we get to the, the next thing, which is um, someone was asking a little bit about changing your uh, doshic level, which you absolutely can do. So the next thing I want you guys to understand is that everyone has a prakruti, which is your genetic amount of vata, pitta, and kapha. It's like the stats that you were, you were like created with. So when you make a character, like you have a strength of 10, an int of 5, and an endurance of 20. Fine. Then what Ayurveda, the, the way that Ayurvedic treatment works is that they modify your, your, your stats, right? They give you like buffs and debuffs that raise your strength or raise your int or lower your endurance. Like it's kind of weird because we just think about strength uh, attributes as being purely positive. That's called your vikruti. So the Vikruti is the amount that your Vata, Pitta, and Kapha are deviated from the norm. So Ayurveda has treatments like food, for example. There are some foods that will lower your Vata, buff your Vata. Some foods that will debuff your Vata. Foods that increase Kapha and decrease Kapha. And foods that increase Pitta and decrease Pitta. There are lifestyle changes you can make. Is APOE4 Pitta? That is a great question. I don't know, but let's find out. Let's do. Let's see if someone has studied this. That question is too good to derail me. See, this is me being Vata. I'm on a roll, and then I just stop. Uh, ha ha! Ah, shit. This is. Not a peer-reviewed article. Is this a peer-reviewed article? I don't know what this journal is. Okay, I don't know. Um, that's a that's a great question. I'm not sure. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So people are asking if you're skinny fat. So skinny fat is a is just you being unhealthy in, in vata. Like, so instead of getting big bone, like, vatas can be fat. It's not like you can't be fat. Skinny fat is a vata that doesn't take care of themselves. But they don't balloon like a guffa, and they're not going to get fat in the same way that a pitta does. They're going to get skinny fat, right? Like, just, th just look at that phrase. Skinny fat. You don't call yourself fat. Intuitively, we recognize that this is a different kind of fat. We call it skinny fat. It's just a completely different kind of fat. It's not a big boned fat. It's a skinny fat. So vata is like, uh, doshas are, are simple to, to see in your own life and simple to observe. You can see kind of the proof right in front of you with the term skinny fat. It's not big boned fat. It's skinny fat. We know that big boned fat is a different kind of fat than skinny fat. That's what Ayurveda says, is that there isn't one kind of fat. There isn't one kind of mind. There isn't one kind of personality. There isn't one kind of memory. Understand which category you fall into. And once you understand which category you fall into, you can adjust yourself accordingly because the solutions for skinny fat and big bone fat are actually different. That you need different things to, to ideally fix skinny fat and ideally fix big bone fat. Um, okay. So where can I find uh, the, the suggested diet and so on for Vata? Okay. So we're going to talk about diet and Vata right now. And then we're going to also talk a little bit about different mental health issues and Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. And then we're going to jump to questions. Simplest thing you can do for Vata. You have to get your bowels moving regularly. So if you're constipated, fix the constipation. Number one. Okay. Even bowel movements. 
Vatas are cold and dry, and so you want to eat foods that are warm and moist. So any anytime you have an option between soup and salad, pick soup. Vatas have weak digestion, so their digestive power is not very high. So you want to cook foods before you eat them. If we think about, like, if you eat, like, a cooked carrot versus a raw carrot, they taste very different. Both of them are sweet, but a cooked carrot is way sweeter. So some of the process of digestion has already been done for you. You've broken down some of, like, the, the walls of the cellular structure of carrots so that the sweetness is more available to you. So vatas should eat foods that are warm and moist. So avoid things like toast. If you have a, an option between toast and oatmeal in the morning, go with oatmeal. For pittas, you want to avoid foods that are warm and wet. So you want to eat things that are cold and dry. So like a, a sandwich is a great food for a pitta. Salad is a great food for a pitta. Kaffas are cold and wet. So you want to eat foods that are warm and dry. So toast is great food for a pitta. I mean, sorry, kaffa. Okay, so cold and dry is vata. So you want to eat foods that are warm and wet. Pitta is warm and wet, so you want to eat foods that are cold and dry. And kapha is cold and wet, so you want to eat foods that are warm and dry. So that's the simplest change to make. You guys can also, like, Google different, like, you can just Google Ayurvedic diet, and I'm sure you guys will find stuff, and you can sort of test it yourself. So there are also six tastes. Sour, sweet, pungent, or, uh, sorry, astringent, spicy, let me think about this. Sour, sweet, salty, spicy, astringent, and bitter. Those are the six tastes. Yeah, so umami is different. So in Ayurveda, there are six tastes, and there, there are particular tastes for each um, vata as well. Um, so that's what I would say to start with vata, pitta, and kapha. Ah, not necessarily. So gluten sensitivity is um, is is a completely different thing, right? So gluten is is a prime example of like Western thinking. So gluten says gluten sensitivity says that gluten one individual compound is the problem for everyone. So if you have like if you have a pro allergic thing to gluten, like that allergy is vata. But what I would say about gluten sensitivity is if you fix your vata, your ability to tolerate gluten should get better. So remember that some people have celiac disease, which is a true allergy to gluten, and that some people have gluten insensitivity. But if you improve your vata, if you lower your vata, your ability to tolerate gluten should improve. Uh, okay. So we have... Um, yeah, so it's autoimmune, but that's exactly what I'm saying, right? Is like you guys have to understand that vata corrects in general autoimmunity. So if you have MS, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, if you have lupus, any of the patients that I work with, when they come in with these things, I give them vata reducing diets and they tend to get better. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about specifically about mental health in Ayurveda. So when a vata mind, so we're going to talk about how stress affects the minds of people with different doshas differently, okay? So how does stress affect your mind depending on what your dosha is? When a vata person undergoes stress, their mind becomes anxious. When a pitta person undergoes stress, their mind becomes irritable or angry. And when a kapha person undergoes stress, they become depressive and isolative. You can even look at, let me actually, uh, let me see if I can find Ayurveda Journal of Health Kanojia. What is this? Is this me? I wrote a paper about this. So I wrote a paper in the Ayurveda Journal of Health about different kinds of depression. So there's like this thing called an anxious depression, which is like a depression that like people's mind is moving very fast. They have difficulty sleeping, like they're insomnia. So I want you guys... Yeah. And then there's a kapha depression, which 
is like uh, what we call a neurovegetative depression. So like people, they're, they're hyper, they have hypersomnia, so they sleep too much, they move very slowly, their thoughts are very slow. And it's weird because like Western medicine classifies both of these as depression. Okay. So like DSM-5 anxious depression. Let's see if I can find you guys a good source on this because I can't find. If someone can find the paper that I wrote in the Ayurveda Journal of Health, everything is laid out there. But it's kind of bizarre that in psychiatry, if you look at the DSM-5 criteria for, for depression, you can have insomnia or hypersomnia. Like, just think about that for a second. That they call it sleep disturbance. But like, they say that depression is the same whether you sleep too much or you sleep too little. That just doesn't make sense to me. So another criteria for DSM, uh, DSM-5 criteria for depression is appetite changes. They call it appetite changes. What that means is that you can eat too much or eat too little. Both of those qualify as depression. It blows my mind as a clinician that a disease where you eat too little is the same as where you eat too much. Those are two different diseases, my friends. If you sleep too little or you sleep too much, we call both of those things depression. Those are two different diseases. There's a vata depression and there's a kapha depression. There's an anxious depression and there's a neurovegetative depression. And clinicians understand this. If you talk to someone who prescribes antidepressants, we have two classes of antidepressants. Clinicians understand this. We have activating antidepressants, which give people a pep in their step. And then we have like calming antidepressants. We have some antidepressants that are also anti-anxiety medications, and we have some antidepressants that are not anti-anxiety medications. So clinicians understand that there are different kinds of depression, but in Western science, like, we just haven't figured this out yet. Actually, actually, we have. I do have another paper for you. So there's also a pitta depression. So you can have a vata depression, a pitta depression, and a kapha depression. Anger attacks. Let me find this in PubMed. I, I gotta just be a reference person. Hold on. I know this is maybe not what you guys are interested in. Anger attacks. So this is fascinating paper. Here we go. Maurizio Fava. Okay, you guys have to check out this paper. Fascinating. You guys want to see Pitta Depression? Read this paper. Maurizio Fava is the Associate Chief of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. Guy's absolutely brilliant. He's a depression researcher. And he discovered back in 98 that there is another subtype of depression. Not just anxious, not just neurovegetative, but what he calls depression with anger attacks. That's bit the depression. The neurotransmitter profile for depression with anger attacks is different from the neurotransmitter profile for anxious depression and neurovegetative depression. The neurotransmitters in each of these depressions is different, and that's been studied. So I'm telling you guys, like, Ayurveda is like, has this spot on. And if you understand that when you're under stress, do you get anxious? Do you get pissed? Or do you get depressive? Why is this thing blurry? So, this is an example of Ayurveda. Right? And that people respond to stresses in different ways. And if you get, if you get angry, angry or irritable when you're under stress, you should eat foods that are cold and dry. Absolutely, right? So Double Mint Dave is saying, I get angry and just tested this pitta in the test. Yeah, so, and someone else was saying, like, are, is, doesn't this create a cognitive bias? Like, yeah, it can. But I don't think it's a cognitive bias because people don't know anything about this. They just, they just circle things, right? A cognitive bias requires knowledge ahead of time. The other thing is, I'm confident based on the genetic testing that is statistically significant that this has real scientific merit. Right? So then the question is, for those of you who are, yeah, so Gizmo. Gizmo is our textbook vata. Lupus gets anxious. That's what I'm telling you guys. So the cool thing, the really cool thing about Ayurveda is if Gizmo balances their vata, their lupus is going to get better, their anxiety is going to get better. Their sleep is going to get better. Their skin is going to get better. Their bowel movements are going to get better. Because if you lower the vata, everything that is associated with elevated vata is going to get better. 
And in Western medicine, we understand this concept clinically as well. When I'm working with someone who has depression and addictions, when one thing goes bad, everything goes bad. So in psychiatry, we have a saying that all boats rise together. So the water level determines the state of all of your disease processes. We know that if you treat someone's anxiety, their IBS gets better. We know if you treat someone's depression, their fibromyalgia gets better. Right? We know this. We know that these things are clinically correlated, but our system of Western medicine is, is looking at individual things and tunneling down, doesn't look at patterns and doesn't look at overarching changes. But we sometimes clinically, we know that, that the, even though our system isn't designed with this in mind, we still see evidence for this idea. And a good example is something like exercise or meditation. Right? Exercise improves everything. Meditation improves everything. Meditation improves depression. It improves anxiety. It actually, there's a fascinating study done by the Benson Henry Institute, which looked at something called MGUS, which is a monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance, which is a precancerous state. And taught those people who have this kind of precancerous state meditation, and then assessed their, their genetic activity, and actually found that the pro-cancerous genes are less active after you learn how to meditate. So this may be the first evidence, or there may be other evidence, I'm not really sure because this isn't my area, but this is actually a really interesting data point that suggests that meditation actually prevents the progression of cancer. And it also treats depression. How does that work? It's because there are some overarching principles behind human health and wellness that once we start accessing those principles through things like exercise, meditation, everything about you is going to get better. And we kind of know that. Like everyone, if you guys like look at like, you know, subreddits like stop gaming and stuff, people say like, or mental health, like you just ask people, they're like, yeah, I started exercising. I feel better about myself. My like rashes got better. Like when I start exercising, my skin problems get better. So Ayurveda is like, it's such low hanging fruit and you can make such positive changes in your life by just adopting Ayurvedic principles. So I think what we're going to have to do, if you guys are curious, we just have to have someone come on and then like we'll talk about some, some specifics of Ayurveda. But the first thing to start with is diet, diet, diet. First line treatment for mental health problems in Ayurveda is dietary change. Change your diet, your anxiety, your, your depression, your anger will get better. And now there's an emerging field. Uh, the hottest topic in medicine right now is, is brain gut. It's this idea that if you change your gut bacteria, your mental health will change. And Ayurveda has been saying that for thousands of years. So now we have scientific evidence between that correlates what happens in our gut and what happens in our brain. Right? So like, this is the coolest study ever. Um, and you guys got to tell me if you really want references, because like, I feel like it breaks my flow, but I feel like it's important for me to back up what I say. Um, so... I saw a fascinating study. They took a bunch of depressed rats. Oh, sorry. They took a bunch of depressed rats, extracted their stool, transplanted their stool to healthy rats, and the rats became depressed from a stool transplant. That is insane. It's completely insane. There are two kinds of bacteria that have been found in people who have high levels of anxiety. So they, they ask someone, are you super anxious? People who say yes, they test your gut bacteria. There are two kinds of bacteria that people have high levels uh, have high levels of bacteria if they're anxious. If people test low for anxiety, there's a different two bacteria that are very prominent. Fascinating stuff. And so if you think about how does diet change your gut bacteria? So if you eat a particular kind of food, you guys have to understand that different gut bacteria have different digestive enzymes. So lactobacillus, which if you guys see probiotic stuff, lactobacillus eats what? Does anybody know? Eats lactose. So if you eat a lot of lactose, what do you think is going to happen to the lactobacillus in your gut? It's going to grow. Because that's what it eats. So there are some bacteria that eat simple sugars, some bacteria that eat lactose, some bacteria that eat complex carbohydrates, some bacteria that eat fiber, some bacteria that eat proteins. 
Like different bacteria eat different kinds of things. And so if you change your bacteria, I mean, if you change your diet, you're going to be feeding some kinds of bacteria and you're going to be killing off or starving other kinds of bacteria. So how does diet improve depression? It's because there are some bacteria that are sending inflammatory signals to your brain that cause depression. Also a fascinating uh, really fascinating uh, study that I just saw recently. People start, uh, did a, a brief clinical trial of giving people anti-inflammatories when they're depressed and their depression got better. So some bacteria create a lot of inflammation, like bacteria that, eat, uh, that digest processed foods create a lot of inflammation. And when they create inflammation, it causes depression. Yeah. So... Like the fascinating thing is that, you know, people have been believing in Ayurveda, you want to believe in it, fine. The reason that I'm excited behind it and the reason that I'm such a proponent of it is because there's actually science to back it up now. We're not quite at the level of clinical studies, but the basic science really suggests that Ayurveda is, is, is good and is correct. And I've seen enough clinic, clinical or anecdotal improvement to where I believe it. So... Um, people are wondering, what, what food do I eat to cure depression? See, this is the wrong thinking. Remember, we just talked about how there are three kinds of depression. There's anxious depression, there's a depression with anger attacks, and there's neurovegetative depression. Depression is not one thing. That's a Western concept. That there's one thing called depression. And all depression has the same treatment. That's exactly what I'm trying to say is incorrect. There are different kinds of depression. What kind of depression do you have? What's your Ayurvedic dosha? That's where you're going to find the right treatment. You guys get that? Like, that's the whole point behind what I'm saying. This is why depression is so fucking hard to cure, because it's not one disease. That's like saying, what do I eat to cure cancer? What is the medicine for cancer? There are different kinds of cancer, my dudes. There are solid tumors. There are lymphatic tumors. There are brain cancers. There are gut cancers. Each of these cancers has a different chemotherapeutic regimen. They're fast-growing cancers. They're slow-growing cancers. Each of them has a different treatment. The reason that depression is hard to treat is because people treat it like a monolithic disease. Like, I don't know. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons why this could be true, but I have very good results with the people that I work with with depression. Like, I, I shit you guys not. Like, I'm, I'm really not trying to toot my own horn, but... There are people that are in my practice that have been on treatment for, like, have been in therapy and medication for anxiety for, like, 15 years. And within six months, we're taping them off of medication. They feel fantastic. Why? Is it because I'm a brilliant clinician? No. This is what I'm saying. I'm not actually any better. It's just I use tools that none of my colleagues use. I use Ayurveda. And it's like, it's OP, man. I'm not actually a better clinician. So this is what I want you guys to understand. I'm not actually saying I'm better than anyone else. All I'm saying is that like all of my colleagues who are treating anxiety as a monolithic illness are doing themselves a disservice because anxiety is not a monolithic illness. There are different kinds of anxiety. And once you understand that, once you start incorporating like anti-vata diets, people get better. I have one person in my practice. I mean, hopefully this isn't. I have also, like, I treat people with skin problems and IBS and things like that. And people, like, like who haven't had solid shits in a decade. And then we start them on Ayurvedic dietary changes, and they have solid shits. And it's, like, it's crazy. It's, like, it's not, I'm not doing anything, I'm not doing anything, like, e extraordinary. I'm just telling them to drink yogurt and water mixed together in, like, a one to two ratio with a pinch of cumin and a pinch of hydrogen sulfide or pink salt or Himalayan salt. And there it gets better. Okay. So once again, I can't, I can't provide medical advice over the internet, but I will tell you. So if you guys have a medical problem like diarrhea or IBS, you should go and see a doctor. And at the same time, something that you should just try because is, is to take yogurt. So like take like, just plain yogurt, not Greek yogurt, not low-fat yogurt, nothing, no sugar or anything, just plain yogurt. Two ounces of yogurt, six ounces of water. Two and a half ounces of yogurt, 5.5 ounces of water. Mix it together. Add a pinch of toasted cumin. Add a pinch of pink salt. Drink it every day. Assuming you're not lactose intolerant or anything. If it gives you problems, don't do it. See what happens to your valve movements. 
This beverage has been used as a treatment for cholera in India for thousands of years. Not soy yogurt. If you're allergic to milk, then don't, don't do it. But some people who are allergic to milk can actually have yogurt. Some people who are lactose intolerant can tolerate yogurt. And the reason is because yogurt has been metabolized by bacteria. So the, the chemical composition is more tolerable than plain milk. Okay? Soy is completely different. Yeah, yogurt gives people acne. Absolutely. You know what's crazy? You know what absolutely blows my mind? Is that there are studies that say that diet has no influence on acne. I just don't believe it. Like, I just don't believe that. Don't do kefir. Kefir usually has, like, sugar and stuff in it, right? No, there's no lactose-free alternative. This is what I'm saying. I mean, there are other things you can do to lower your vata. You don't have to use lactose, but that's the simplest thing. See, there you go. Hal3979 says it. I'm lactose intolerant, but not to yogurt. See, this is the whole problem, is that Western medicine says lactose intolerant, and it assumes that all kinds of lactose are the same. They're not the same. These are different compounds. Each compound, so this is what Ayurveda says. My favorite page from a text of Ayurveda, I think is from Jarak Samhita, is one page that compares and contrasts the different kinds of milk. So we're going to play a fun game, Twitch chat. How many kinds of milk can you come up with? Let's see if you can hit all of them. Whey isn't milk. Whey is a compound within milk. Nope. Nope. None of these are correct. This is not milk. There we go. There we go. Soy milk is not milk, my dudes. Skim milk is not milk. Goat. Cow. What else? Where else can we get human milk? Absolutely. Sheep's milk. What else? We've got four. You already said milk. Human beings don't drink cat milk. Buffalo milk. Five. Good. So we've got goat, sheep, cow, human, buffalo. What else? What else do humans drink milk from? Anyone know? Camel milk. Yes. And? Not daddy's milk. That's disgusting. Trees? No. Bats? No. 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 We already got goats. One more. A horse, yeah. And elephant. Elephant is the last milk. It's a fascinating thing. This, this page, people, humans don't drink cat milk. Humans drink milks from hooved animals. That's what we drink milk from, right? We drink milk from domesticated animals. We have domesticated elephants in India. Right? We don't drink dog milk. We don't drink carnivore's milk. You guys realize that? Just think about that for a second. If you observe the world, you will learn all kinds of fascinating things about humans. Human beings drink milk from hooved animals, not carnivores. Why the fuck that is, I don't know. But Ayurveda says don't drink milk from a carnivore. Like, I don't know why. I don't know why. Right? Just think about that. We don't drink milk from carnivores, but we do drink milk from herbivores. We dr drink milk from hooved mammals. And then this text page of Ayurveda says that the different milks are good for alleviating different doshas. And that different milks are treatments for different things. So if a human being is recovering from malaria, they should have a certain kind of milk. And if they have active malaria, they should have a different kind of milk. Like this is the specificity that Ayurveda has. It breaks down each and every food that we have and says that an apple is different from an orange. That a lime is different from an orange. That a lemon is different from a lime. That all fruits, five servings of fruits and vegetables, is they're not all the same. And we know this, right? So for example, if you have a weak digestion, you have difficulty digesting foods, you should eat papayas and pomegranates on alternate days. Right? So we, like Ayurveda has been saying that, naturopathy has been saying that for thousands of years. And now we know through science 
that papaya has this enzyme called papain, which like breaks down food. So it makes digestion easy. If you guys go to like a health food store, you go to the supplement aisle, you'll see papain enzyme is a dietary supplement to help you break things down. And for those of you guys who marinate food, why do you marinate things? Why do you never marinate in papaya? You guys know why you never marinate in papaya? Anybody know? Okay, we're going to do a fun game. We're going to do a fun game. If you guys... Yes, right? So, like, if you marinate in so something in papaya, it turns, it turns to mush. It just straight, like, dissolves it, and it's like a puddle of, like, mud when you're done. So if you guys don't believe me, try it, right? So if, if, if what I say is, if you guys don't believe me, by all means, try it. You guys are not, if you don't have faith in the fact that we can predict things, and the references have been insufficient, just try it. So what would you say if pears always give me diarrhea? I'd say stop eating pears. <laughs> right? So this is the thing, is that everyone's, everyone's digestive systems are different. And Ayurveda will tell you what kinds of food to eat and not eat. It's clear to me that we're going to have to do a lot more stuff on Ayurveda. So I'm going to have to like write stuff up for you guys. Like guides to this stuff. From start to finish. I'll do it. I've started already. But, yeah. Okay. Let's do questions. Questions. 